What's shaking of Fire Nation? JLD here, and welcome to episode 1675 of EO Fire, where I am chatting with today's most inspiring entrepreneurs seven days a week. And goals equal success, Fire Nation. So, with the Freedom Journal, you will be accomplishing your number one goal in 100 days. Now, let's chat with today's featured guest, Bill Treasurer. Bill, are you prepared to ignite? You. Betcha. Yes. <laughs> Bill's the author of A Leadership Kick in the, we'll say, booty, <laughs> and three other books. He's worked with thousands of leaders across the globe from organizations such as NASA, Saks Fifth Avenue, Lenovo, CNN, the Pittsburgh Pirates, and the U.S. Veterans Administration. His motto is be courageous. Bill, take a minute, fill in some gaps from that intro, and give us just a little glimpse of your personal life. Well, first of all, it's great to be back. I yes. know we did 965, and today we're up at 1675. So look at how you've grown. <laughs> That's terrific. Uh, as you mentioned, some of my background, I'll add a little bit more to that. I'm a dad. I've got t uh, twin 13-year-old kids, a boy and a girl, Alex and Bina. And I also have a 10-year-old. Uh, his name is Ian, and I love being a dad most of all. Like yourself, I also lead a crazy busy life this week alone. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to work with four back-to-back -back different organizations all up in Chicago. And this month alone, I'm working with 10 different organizations, including eBay, Lenovo, and NASA. So the long of that and short of that is that, boy, I have a great and fun and interesting life. The bad news is I'm also getting an MRI today because I do so much troubling. <laughs> I do so much traveling that it hurts my back. <laughs> oh, brutal. Well, make sure you say hello to eBay and Lenovo. Those are both past sponsors of EO Fire. So uh, we love what they have going on for all of those reasons. And again, Fire Nation, as Bill mentioned, he was episode 965. So about 700-ish days ago, he was on talking about his worst moments his lessons learned, his aha moment, all that jazz. So definitely go back and check out episode 965 for that story because we're going to be talking about something a little bit different today. But before we get into that, Bill, you over these last couple of years have continued to refine, to hone your area of expertise. So break that down for us. Let Fire Nation know what your area of expertise is and then give us one tip, tool, or tactic that's unique that we probably don't know that we should. So I started my business 15 years ago as a courage building company, and we help people and organizations be more courageous. And I started with my first book, which was on personal risk taking. That is your ability to get off whatever platform of risk you might be standing on. And as you know, some of my, the sort of theater of my background prior to all of that, before graduate school, before working at Accenture, where I worked before I started my own company, I was a professional high diver, and I used to dive off of 100-foot platforms into little pools that were only 10 feet deep, traveling at speeds in excess of 50 miles an hour, protected only by a Speedo. No big deal. No big deal. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so I started the company as a courage building company to, because it's really not about my high dive. It's about your high dive. And it's about all the high dives that your listeners are, are contemplating and thinking about taking whatever platform of safety they might be standing on. And especially for entrepreneurs, how do they get off that platform to do the entrepreneurial things that they'd like to do? So I've been doing that now for 15 years. And, um, and of course, my thinking, like everybody's, does evolve, and it's moved more into the leadership development arena in the last six uh, or so years. And in particular, I'm now enamored, yes, with the idea of courage, but it has also now included the idea of opportunity and how opportunity is so important to motivating the workforce. And my recent thinking, which the new book is really fo focused on, is this intersection between confidence. We want leaders who have confidence by all means. But that confidence, we want to make sure that it's anchored to humility. And humility is not an easy thing to acquire unless you have some seasoning events, as, as a lot of your entrepreneurs are probably learning. They don't learn it right away, but eventually entrepreneurs learn that sometimes those seasoning events that help you become more humble are often the result of humiliation and something that uh, a lot of times when our ego has gotten too large, there's a reverberation 
that uh, in the form of a consequence. So that's where my thinking is today. I'm sure we'll get into some of that I, that thinking. Well, Fire Nation, when you face that horrendous humiliation that awaits us all in some way, shape, or form in the future, it's just going to happen at some point, realize, hey, this is just a great learning point for me. This is where I can say, hey, I obviously let something get a little out of control, probably my ego. How can I learn from that? Bring it back in. One thing I always go to whenever I'm having a lot of success with EO Fire is my Uncle Steve, where I was growing up, and anytime I'd be doing good and bad, basketball or maybe even school, he would always look at me and say, John, be humble, be happy. So I always equated humbleness with happiness. And I think if we can do that a little bit more, we'll be better served moving forward. But as you mentioned, Bill, you have some things to share with us regarding your new book, which is Explain. You call yourself a plumber. Why so? Talk to us about that. A lot of leadership folks like to call themselves experts, right? And that just seems so pretentious to me. And, I, you know, certainly I've worked with thousands of leaders from pretty, you know, amazing organizations and such. But, I, you know, the work that I do is not just theoretical. I'm not just standing in front of a crowd espousing these platitudes about leadership. I mean, I literally roll up my sleeves and go and work sometimes one on one with these leaders facing whatever challenges that they might be facing and thinking together and co-creating with them. So it's not just me proffering my advice and telling them to, to you know, take my tablets that I give them, the holy man on the mountain. Uh, instead, you know, I really learn a lot from them. I learn so much from my clients about the hardships that they face, the, the, uh, the challenges that they endure, and ultimately the rewards that they get for calling forth their better self, their leader self. No, I don't think of myself as the, this sort of leadership expert. I mean, if people want to call me that, that's great. But what I really think of myself as a guy who rolls up his sleeves, who puts on his coveralls, who helps leaders re remove whatever hairballs might be mucking up their systems <laughs> to help them be a better leader. <laughs> now, one thing that we talked about a little bit in the pre-interview chat was that every now and then a leader needs a swift kick in the booty. So, why is that the case? Are we talking all the way from like your generals to your CEOs, all the way down the line to your quote unquote experts, you know, which just really, again, is a better word being plumber. Why is this the case that we need a little swift kick in the booty from time to time? I think it's almost a natural consequence. It's a natural consequence of one, one's ego. When their ego gets too invested, when their ego gets too inflated, uh, there will often be, almost as a natural law, a consequence, a, a reverberation that comes back and, and kicks the leader in the booty. You know, the, the coach of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Clint Hurdle, wrote the foreword to the new book. And in the first line of the book, I think he really captures it well. He says that as the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates and as a coach of a major league baseball team, he has learned that there are two types of leaders, those who have been humbled and those who are about to be. In other words, it's inevitable as part of the seasoning process of a leader that you're going to run into yourself. A lot of times we're our own worst enemies. And, and often, as I mentioned, it's our own ego stake that gets us into trouble. And so we'll get a reverberation. And I've seen it and it takes many, as you know, uh, it takes many different forms that, that might be. So, for example, you might uh, two of your teammates or, or two of the direct reports that you have in the last six months might quit. And in exit interviews, they cite your own obnoxious behavior as the reason that they're leaving. Or you might do a 360 degree feedback and get feedback from your people that's now unfiltered and it's anonymous and they cite your obnoxious behavior. Um, you might get fired. Uh, you might get a, a client as an entrepreneur, or you might get a client or customer that uh, quits your service and decides to go with a arch rival competitor. It can take many different shapes and forms. But when it happens, you really have a choice. Am I going to double down in my conviction that my ego was right and therefore not learn anything and make the circumstances the cause of what happened? Or are you going to say, how did I contribute to this mess that's been made? And what do I need to change about myself that might be worthwhile and make me a stronger and better and more authentic and more humble leader? So that that's sort of part of the thinking of it. Like I look at my journey and frankly, Fire Nation, if I don't get humbled in some way, shape or form, every month, I start getting kind of nervous because I know a really big one's about to come because it's just part of life. It's just part of the journey. And now the question is, 
do I sit there and say like, how can I just continue being stubborn and bullying ahead? Or do I take this feedback and, and learn how I contributed to this potential negative feedback or to this humility that was served my way and just get better every single time? And I mean, for a great example specifically is I write a lot of emails and, and I like to be pretty strong in my emails with my points of view and with my ideas and with my thoughts and the side of the table that I'm on. And that's always going to get feedback from people on one side that they really agree with it or other people that really disagree with it. And I take both with that understanding that, hey, I'm not going to just think that people that agree with me are right. I'm going to really dig deep and learn from those people that say, John, I think you're wrong for these reasons because guess what? I might be wrong for those reasons. How did I contribute to them thinking that way? Now, you talk about two dysfunctional types of leaders. You call them the pig heads and the weaklings. Break down those a little more in depth. Having worked with thousands of leaders and many of them one on one, right? Like Friday, I'm working with one uh, group up in Chicago and it's back to back one on one coaching sessions. Uh, so I do a lot of executive coaching in addition to a whole bunch of other stuff that I work on. But you really get to you get to understand sort of the mindset of a leader over time. And what I have found is that I think that the highest aspiration, uh, the ideal leader, like if you think of the leaders that you most admire, that you've worked with, that really have seemed to, you know, they've got it going on, is that they have confidence by all means. And we're confident in their direction. We're confident in the authoritative way that they share with us and speak to us and even sometimes direct us. And they also haven't lost sight of their roots. They know where they came from. They can get real with us. Uh, they share their story with us. In other words, they have humility. So we, we like the idea of the blend of both. We want confidence, but we want it anchored to humility. We don't want to feel like our leader thinks that they're better than us. We want them to, we want to feel like they're serving us in some way. That said, so we focus a lot on different types of leadership. But what I've come to learn is when confidence moves into overconfidence and in fact it becomes, you know, confidence moves into conceit or self-absorption, we now can start to become a pig head. And a pig head leader is the leader who has to be all about themselves and it has to be their way or the highway. Uh, I think, you know, sort of the motto for them is if you're not part of the bulldozer, you're part of the pavement. And that kind of leader will get a lot of done, got a lot of, you know, they'll get results done at the cost of a lot of wreckage behind them that they cause through their own force of personality. But people are afraid of the pig head. So they, they tend to allow, the, they in fact enable the leader to go on with their obnoxious behavior. But at some point in time, there will be a reverberation, a kick brought upon by their own inflated ego that has the potential, hopefully, to mitigate and uh, sort of shrink their ego back to size. Now, on the other side of the continuum is when somebody has too much humility, where they make it always about everybody else to their own self-neglect, whereas the pig head is self-absorbed, the weakling, this is what I call them, the weakling is self-neglectful. And these are wishy-washy leaders. These are leaders who have no backbone. These are the leaders who don't stand up for themselves or anyone around them. And ultimately, they don't get any results and they become irrelevant, which is the death knell to any career. So these are the two leaders you don't want to be, the pig head from an overinflated ego and the, the weakling from no ego at all. So we want to get back to the middle place where I have self-respect and I treat myself self-respectfully and I respect others equally. So this idea of respect in healthy proportions bringing me to confidence and humility, which is the admiration point of leadership. Self-respect, respect others equally. If you can focus in on those two things, Fire Nation, you're going to win. And I do love that phrase, everything in moderation, even moderation, Fire Nation. If you find yourself too far on either end of the spectrum, things are eventually going to get pretty uneven. Now, we do have some reverberations coming your way, Fire Nation, as soon as we thank our sponsors. One of the most critical things that I've done in my business to date is spending time doing things that don't scale, like engaging one-on-one -on -one with my audience. Now, I'll always engage one-on-one -on -one with my audience, but in order to grow a successful and sustainable business, implementing automation and other marketing strategies is a must. So what's the best way to build a meaningful relationship with your audience that's scalable? 
via email. Constant Contact's email marketing makes it easy for you to connect with your audience through easy to use tools like drag and drop design, real time formatting, and a state of the art editor, which makes it easy to create interactive content that drives engagement. Plus, with Constant Contact, you'll get free expert coaching when and where you need it, making it easy to get results fast. So if you ever have a question or need just a little marketing advice, there is someone there to help. See how you can be a marketer. Sign up for a free trial today at constantcontact.com slash podcast. That's constantcontact.com slash podcast. Feel like you're in a crowded market? Entrepreneurs worldwide know that exact same feeling. But what if you could grow your top line with new customers by looking outside of the United States? If you're looking for an untapped version of Amazon or Google to help you connect with a worldwide marketplace, then look no further than Alibaba. Alibaba is an e-commerce platform where you can buy and sell anything. Alibaba is even hosting a two-day conference in Detroit called Gateway 17 on June 20th and 21st, where you'll learn how to capitalize on the fastest growing consumer market in the world, meet experts like Jack Ma, build relationships, and learn from companies who are already in China. Availability is limited, and I've secured an amazing offer. Save up to 50% on your registration fee by visiting gateway17.com and entering code FIRE. This is a great growth opportunity for businesses and entrepreneurs alike, so be sure to visit gateway17.com and enter code FIRE when you reserve your spot today. That's G-A-T-E-W-A-Y-1-7 dot com code FIRE. So Bill, we're back. And something that I love that you say is leaders need to have a holy shift. That's S-H-I-F-T, <laughs> Fire Nation, shift. Bill, what do you mean by that? Holy shift. Is, <laughs> uh, it comes down to, you know, I think that leaders start from a place early on in your career. Like I think of my own career, for example, and, and the, the path and the arc that it's taken. And in my early 30s, about 30 years old or so, you know, even in the late 20s, I, I had sharp elbows. And that's called ambition. And, and to some expect, uh, you know, to some degree, we want people, human beings to have ambition. We want you to move ahead. And you've got to be thinking out for yourself. Uh, the challenge is over time, if it's all about you all the time, it becomes obnoxious to the other people that you might be influencing and maybe even eventually leading. So you get to this place, again, this reverberation point, either brought on by over ego or a lack of ego, either a pig head or a weakling. And now you have this reverberation. Maybe you get fired. Maybe you get a bad 360. Maybe you get uh, terrible results this year that, to make you want to quit your business. Um, it could take any shape or form. But when that moment happens, if you're able to Understand how you've contributed to that moment. If you're willing to look at your own contribution, and here's how you can tell, uh, John Lee, the, the, uh, that you've made the shift, is when you start from a position of, I was wrong, uh, duh. somebody wronged me, I was wronged, but eventually you get to the place where you think, you know what, mm, it's not that I was wronged, I was wrong. And you drop the ed mm. at the end. When you get to a place of saying, you know what? I contributed to this. I was wrong. Now you have the potential to have the holy shift. And the holy shift is a movement away from your own self-aggrandizement or self-focus and start focusing on the people that you're leading. Um, I'll give you a quick story that is just coming to me right now. A lot of times when I'm doing a, a boot camp, for example, I'll bring in a buddy of mine. He's Captain John Havlick, who worked as a he was a Navy SEAL for 29 years. And he talks about when he was going through Hell Week and he was coming in as an officer going through Hell Week. Um, he got to a point where he wanted to ring the bell as a SEAL. And when you ring the bell, you're out of the SEAL program. But he, he quietly told somebody during this arduous hell week that he, you know, he was thinking about ringing the bell. And one of the, um, you know, commanding officers there pulled him aside and said, Havlick, I think you, I, I heard that you're getting ready to ring the bell. Is that true? And Havlick said, uh, well, you know, I, I guess I've, you know, I've thought about that. And he says, well, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to go and get a coffee. I, I'm going to go walk over to that coffee station in 30 seconds. I'm going to come back and I want you to think hard about this decision. Don't make a decision in 30 seconds that will affect the rest of your life in the negative way. And so he goes and he gets the coffee and it actually takes like a minute. He comes back to Captain John Havlin. He says, what did you decide? He says, I'm in. 
I'll stay. And he said, good. Now stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about the people that you're leading. Mm. The holy shift is a way to get out of yourself and start thinking about the people that you're leading. John Lee, it's my, uh, what I call the number one law of leadership is this. It is not about you. Leadership is not about you, the leader. It's about the people you're privileged to lead and the mark that you can leave on their life for betterment, that you can help make them a better person through the influence of your leadership. So that's the holy shift away from yourself into service, from selfishness to service. Wow, we could end on that, Fire Nation, and it would be an epic interview. But I want you to bring us home, Bill, with talking specifically about your book, Explain, because it culminates with this chapter called Leading at the Point of Goodness. Tell us about that. To explain a little bit about the title, I know it has a, it has a three-letter swear word in the title, <laughs> a leadership kick in the, let's just call it booty. booty. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting, John Lee, and you might know this too as an author, is that sometimes we don't e- even know what was informing the book until after the book was written. So and I, I realized after this book was fully written that where it was coming from is that the, the largest volume of business that I've done has been the last dozen years has been working with three unionized construction companies in Chicago. And that three-letter swear word is like the tamest word in the in the room whenever I'm working with them. And in fact, I dedicated the book to the CEO of one of the companies that I work with up there, Aldridge Electric Company. Um, so, so the book is basically about this idea. That, you know, we learn a lot. You, you can learn from leadership books. You can learn from workshops. You can learn from executive coaching. But we really learn from these seasoning events that we have. Mark Twain said that good judgment is the result of experience and experience is the result of bad judgment. So I figured let's take this book and instead of looking at all the glory stuff and all all the uh, get on the soapbox platitude stuff, let's look at where we really learn. And that's from these seasoning events. And how do you go through it and how can you turn it into a holy shift so that you start moving towards service as a leader? This idea at the end is leading from the point of goodness. And what I get into is that you can't be a conditional leader. A lot of leaders that I'll talk to in my one-on-one coaching sessions are like, I know I need to be a better leader, but you don't understand right now is not the time because I'm, I'm under the gun on this huge project. Or, you know, I know I can be a better leader, but I don't have time to be able to devote to my people right now because this thing that I'm dealing with is so consequential. I promise I'm going to be a better leader as soon as things at home start to settle down a little bit, but I just had another baby. And we come up with all the reasons why it's conditionally that I'll be a leader when the conditions around me line themselves up that allow me constitutionally to be a better leader. And what I'm saying in the last chapter is no, the place to start from leadership, the, the place to start as a leader is with your internal goodness. Start by being a good person that has values, knows what those values are, lives by those values unconditionally, especially when you're tempted not to live those values, especially when the situation around you is calling for you to compromise your values. That's when you're called most to lead out of that place of goodness. And leading at the point of goodness is being unconditionally good as a leader, especially when it's tempting not to be. Bill, let's end this interview on fire, brother, with you giving us a parting piece of guidance, the best way that we can connect with you, and then we'll say goodbye. Sounds good. So my piece of advice, strangely enough, would be make sure that you as a leader and as an entrepreneur occasionally are getting entirely disconnected. Remove all of your electronic tethers, get some mental quiet, go for a gigantic walk, go to a retreat center, go to a pond where you can sit and contemplate, but connect to your inner resources. You've got inner wisdom, and it's easy these days to lose sight of the fact that some of the best wisdom you'll ever get lives right inside of you. You just got to quiet the mind down so that you can develop your own point of view and listen to the inner wisdom that resides inside side of you. And remember to always do the next right thing. The right thing will become available to you when you quiet down and listen to your inner resources. And that that there's a spirituality connected to that idea. Um, 
And, and doing the next right thing becomes much more self-evident when you're quiet enough in t- contemplation that, that it becomes revealed to you. I would love to hear from your listeners. They can go to giantleapconsulting.com, couragebuilding.com, billtreasurer.com, any number of ways they can reach me. Fire Nation, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and you've been hanging out with BT and JLD today, so keep up the heat and head over to eofire.com. If you type Bill in the search bar, not just this episode, but episode 965, where Bill drops value bombs on his journey as an entrepreneur, it's all there. Check it out. Both are epic episodes, and these are the best show notes in the biz. There's timestamps. There's links galore. Don't forget to check out the links that Bill just talked about, and of course, a leadership kick in the booty, but of course, substitute booty for that donkey, and it's, it's all good. <laughs> and Bill, thank you for sharing your journey with Fire Nation today. For that, we salute you, brother, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thanks, buddy. Hey, Fire Nation, hope you enjoyed our chat with Bill today. And if you are ready to t- 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 turn your funnels on fire, here's a free step by step course that was created by me, JLD, and it's awaiting you at funnelonfire.com. I will catch you there or I'll catch you on the flip side. The best way to build a meaningful relationship with your audience that's scalable is email. And Constant Contact makes it easy. See how you can be a marketer. Sign up for a free trial today at constantcontact.com slash podcast. That's constantcontact.com slash podcast.